Welcome to the inside of one of my cylinders. No chunks yet. And pour some of it out, see if we find any glitter. I'm gonna do what a lot of you guys wanted me to do in the last video. I'm just gonna send it because I really wanna see if this thing will fire up. Pry bar. Alright, here we go. Come on. This does not open. Glass is starting to move. Oh. <laughs> it's gonna open. Oh. Oh my god, this weighs hundreds of pounds. Oh, Jesus. Oh, come on, baby. Gee. <laughs> Guys, I'm not kidding. This is insane. This is insane. Oh. Gee. Oh. Ah, you can literally chop your hands off. This thing, no joke, take your freaking hands off. I need to work out. If I meet you guys up at a car meet or a car for coffee, if anyone can lift this up 10 times in a row, I'll buy you coffee. All right guys, seriously, this hatch is no joke. It will literally kill you, I swear. If it were to fall, and you had your head in there, you would die. Okay, so with the death hatch closed, welcome back to Legit Street Cars. My name is Alex. Sorry I look a little disheveled. I've been working a ton lately. The newborn won't sleep. I've been really busy, but either way, I'm super excited for this video because behind me is my very unique 1985 Firebird Trans Am. And since revealing this car just a few days ago, I've learned a ton of its history. So the previous longtime owner of 20 years reached out. I spoke with him on the phone. He sent me a bunch of pictures of the car and he even told me about the built crate engine and the built transmission that he installed in it just a few years ago. I also received a message from the guy who spent three years building this car back in the early 90s and he's also built cars that look like this, like this, and like this, and believe it or not, he's actually a big deal in the world of Knight Rider. So in this video, you guys are gonna learn a ton about this car's history, all while we work on it and try and get the engine started, or at least diagnose why it sounds like this. <laughs> I'll leave the reveal video linked down below if you wanna check it out, but for those who tuned in, you guys know that I may have a bad engine, which would totally suck because this is a built 350, which I'll talk to you about here in a minute, or it could possibly be a bad starter. Now I'm giving myself a strict budget of $1,000 to get this Firebird totally road worthy, even if it needs a new engine. So that means I need to save on everything, but luckily I have Honey, who's gonna make sure I get the best deal on everything I buy on the internet. Honey is a totally free web browser extension that automatically applies all the promo and coupon codes when you check out and it installs in just two clicks. One here and one here and you're done. Now I'm being hopeful it's a bad starter so I added a starter, engine oil and a filter to my cart and the dancing coin dude went nuts. He automatically found coupon codes that saved me a whopping $27 on this single purchase alone. This works on all the popular sites like Amazon, eBay, eBay, Walmart, and even tires from Tire Rack, and I highly recommend you install it on your significant other's computer too. Check this out. Honey saved over $131 on some jewelry and a dress from Ann Taylor, and in my book, that equates to more car parts for me, right? So myself, everybody in my family, we've had Honey installed on all of our computers for years, and it saves us a ton of money. Not having Honey is like giving up free money, so just go to joinhoney.com 
slash legit streetcars. That's joinhoney.com slash legit streetcars. This lets them know that I sent you and it supports the channel at no cost to you. So thank you so much for doing that. And a big thanks to Honey for sponsoring this video. Now let's try and get this engine started. All right, it's the next morning. I've cleaned myself up just a little bit and I've had time to gather my thoughts. And these are the most common ideas from myself and from you guys in the comments section of what could be wrong with this Chevy 350. And yes, this is a crate engine. The previous owner replaced this about 10 years ago. So it came with a 305 with I think like 180 horsepower and a five speed manual. Uh, and now we have a crate 350. He thinks this is either the 330 or 350 horsepower variant, but this is a turnkey crate engine from carburetor to oil pan. Uh, and then he got a built 700, a mild built 700 R4 uh, with a higher stall converter uh, at the same time. So he basically replaced the entire drivetrain in one shot uh, about 10 years ago. Not exactly sure on the miles, but not that many. So this gives me hope that the engine is not bad. Uh, and this is a massive upgrade versus the roughly 180 horsepower crappy 305 that came in this car. Uh, but anyway, this is what we're going to be looking into right away. Uh, piston rings stuck to cylinder walls. I mentioned this in the last video. Uh, if you let an engine sit around for too long, the rings can actually uh, develop some rust around them and freeze themselves into the cylinder wall. You can spray some oil in the cylinder sometimes and break this free, uh, but we're going to inspect it with a boroscope. Uh, we could also have rod or main bearings contacting the crank. So this could be maybe they ran low or ran dry of oil. Uh, whatever the case may be, we're basically seizing, binding up, or locked up. The crank can't turn. Uh, so we're going to drain the oil, see if we have any metal shavings. Uh, starter uh, gear to flex plate is binding. This is something that you guys had mentioned a bunch of times in the comments section, uh, and that's the starter may need to be shimmed out. So I've worked on cars for roughly 20 years now, but a lot of the newer stuff, so I haven't worked on a lot of Chevy small blocks, all the starters I've done, I just put in with no shim. So I didn't know this. Thank you so much. Uh, I got the shim, so we're going to try that out for sure. Uh, or it could be a bad starter, which would be really cool. All right. Welcome. Welcome to the inside of one of my cylinders. The piston looks pretty clean right off the bat. Not a lot of carbon buildup, which to me indicates this might be a very low mileage engine. So let's look around for any damage. And we're looking at the cylinder wall right off the bat. And I will say this, guys, these newer HD boroscopes with the LED lights at the end of the camera, they exaggerate everything. So I know these look like deep scratches, but those are the cross hatching marks from the honing process. So that's a good thing. Uh, and then you see the purple and black lines. I do believe that the pistons uh, were kind of frozen there and they left that mark. The rings left that mark on the cylinder walls, but nothing is gouged. Nothing looks permanently damaged. Uh, but I would say that this cylinder was probably dry for quite some time. Uh, and that all eight of these pistons are partially seized in there, which is causing a ton of resistance, uh, which is why I can't turn the engine over by hand, even though the high torque starter uh, can get it going with a full battery, but it's spinning at like half an RPM. But take a look at the cross hatching marks, those little crowns there. Uh, everything looks really clean. So I definitely think we need to lubricate the insides of these cylinders uh, before we start this car. Getting to some of these spark plugs looks impossible, especially from the top. So a lot of these, uh, it's much easier to get from the bottom and you have to use a wrench on some of them. I'm not sure if there's a special like stubby socket or something when you have these, uh, these header tubes right in the way, but check this out. I disconnected the battery too. You don't want to get shorted out, but all right, see, there we go. The wrench in this situation is a lifesaver. And I think I can use that on a couple of them from the bottom. All right, so all eight spark plugs are out. They look to be in excellent condition, so I'm not gonna be replacing these just yet, especially because we don't even know if this 350 is any good. Uh, here are the GM starter shims, which we're gonna be installing shortly. And these are vice grips, and these are channel locks. In the last video, I propped up the hood with vice grips. I used the word channel locks. A lot of you guys let me know about that. I'm sorry, I used the wrong word. It was really cold out. But anyway, these are vice grips. They work really, really well to hold up the hood of old cars. <laughs> so here is what we're gonna be using uh, to lubricate these cylinders. So this is just an old, really old squirt bottle uh, that I have with half trans fluid and half engine oil. Uh, and then we're gonna be bombing the cylinders with a mist of this stuff called Globo. I've been using this since I was like 15 years old. It works really, really well uh, at lubricating, penetrating, it repels moisture. So I think this will get in all the little nooks and crannies. Uh, and the first time I used this guy was when I was rebuilding the engine on my 1988 Trans Am GTA that had a 350 as well. So I found it to be only fitting to use it again on this third gen Firebird. I think this is the only one I'll be able to get 
from the top. So a couple squirts, that should be good. And then we'll mist in some of the Globo with the straws, it'll work really nice. Okay. All right, now I gotta do seven more. Okay, I've lubricated all eight cylinders and now I wanna turn this engine over by hand just to kind of move all that oil around, make sure it's contacting all the way around the piston. Uh, and before I do that, I want to just loosen up the starter and see uh, if it will retract because I don't wanna drag this uh, with us while we try to turn it over. So let's see what happens. Oh, let me turn this guy up. Yep, there we go. Starter has retracted nicely. Uh, and I really am hopeful that the shims will totally fix this part of the problem. That would be amazing. So we may have a two part problem with the rings and the starter, um, but that's better than it being something with the bearings. While we're waiting for all that oil to uh, kind of circulate around the cylinder, I'm going to uh, drain this and hope that we don't have any metal shavings. But anyway, first let's turn the engine over. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm excited that we can get this running in this video. That would be amazing. Okay, so in the last video, I did try turning this over uh, by hand and I couldn't do it. I felt like I would break the crank bolt off. Um, only that high torque starter was able to just barely spin this. Uh, and for those of you guys who just said to spray gas or carbon choke cleaner into the carburetor and send it, this is why you don't send it. We had the starter still engaged, so we would have taken the starter along with it, and all the cylinders were dry. So if you hear uh, an engine that's cranking very slowly and then there's a screeching sound, it's usually for a reason. So anyway, let's see. Oh yeah, it's not turning just yet. Oh yeah, see? I said it was locked up just because a starter can plow through things. I had said the word locked up and people are like, well, the engine is spinning, so it's not locked up. Yeah, I know, I made the video. I'm literally holding the camera watching it spin. But when it's going at like half an RPM and you hear a screeching sound, it's locking up. So what's the difference between an engine uh, where all the bearings have contacted the crank and it's just about to totally lock and an engine that did lock? Nothing, they're both totally screwed. So I use the word locked and everybody said, not everybody, some guy, probably new guys of the channel. He's not a real mechanic. He said it's locked and it's spinning. Really, really dude? Ugh. Anyway, so this is really difficult right now. I don't wanna break this crank bolt. It is a massive bolt, but still. Ugh. All right, let's just try one thing here. All right, we got a longer breaker. It's like, if it is the rings holding this up, then we just need to kind of let it break loose a little bit with that oil. Oh, oh, that was not the bolt. <laughs> that was my ratchet, okay. No, she's not turning at all. All right, we'll let that oil soak in there for a little bit longer uh, in the cylinders. Maybe it'll loosen up the rings. Uh, and in the meantime, let's drain the oil and hope we don't see metal. Moment of truth here on the bottom end. I'm gonna save this oil just in case some stuff comes out of it that we want to take a look at. Always fun to look at carnage. Let's hope there's nothing in here. Well, let's hope there's oil in here. Let's hope there's no metal in here. <laughs> okay, so nothing on the uh, drain plug that doesn't necessarily mean anything though. But so far, no chunks. It's not looking too bad on the dipstick. It looked kind of clear like it was, uh, wasn't that old. I mean, this obviously is black, but nothing yet, nothing yet. <laughs> If this oil is totally clean, it's gotta be those cylinders. It's gotta be the rings, which we can work with. We can get a car running that has frozen rings, even if it's scuffed up the walls a little bit. I'm not saying the engine's gonna last forever now. I don't recommend you let an engine sit forever. If you are gonna have an engine sit, you can spray like a product like Globo. There's a bunch of other stuff on the market uh, that keeps things lubricated and repels moisture. That's always a good idea. But I have a feeling that this thing sat around for a few years and just wasn't started. No chunks yet, it's looking good. I don't see any shavings in there yet, nothing glittery at all. We'll pour some of this out uh, on a white piece of paper to further inspect, but I think we're gonna be in good shape. All right, let's mix up our organic milk here and pour some of it out, see if we find any glitter. And no, this is totally clean. I don't see anything in this oil at all. That is fantastic. While that oil and penetrating oil is soaking into the uh, piston rings, hopefully breaking that up, let's shim out the starter. Fix that problem. Come here, Kurt. 
<laughs> okay, so I've never actually done this, but it, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. We're basically just spacing it out with a shim. So this is gonna go on the top of the starter, uh, and then we're gonna put our normal starter bolts through it. And that's about it. I hope that we can salvage the starter. That would be awesome. There you go. See the shim up there? I'm actually not really even sure of which way it goes. I'll flip it around, see if that makes more sense. But anyway, the shim goes on top and then we bolt it up and then I'll show you uh, how it's supposed to, how the teeth are supposed to mesh into the flex plate. Okay, so I kind of had to mess around with the orientation of this thing. Uh, I kind of forgot which way I had it, but either way, it's pretty obvious. So now at this point, we want to pull out that starter gear and see if it's going to release back. So all we have to do for this is one of these and see how it's meshing in the starter. I mean, in the flex plate, there we go. And it's still not retracting. So this is kind of trial and error. They give you a few shims on uh, basically the clearance between these teeth and these teeth are just too tight. So it's just kind of getting hung up on the flex plate. So we'll put another one in, it'll drop it down and hopefully give us plenty of clearance inside of these teeth. All right guys, I have been battling with the starter to get the alignment uh, of the teeth correct. I'm still not there, but it's been a couple hours. So I decided to see if I could turn the engine. Check this out. <laughs> like butter. Oh, that's so nice. So after a couple hours of the oil transfluid and glo globo sitting in the cylinders, it kind of soaked in there. So I think that was the major problem. Now we still obviously have uh, a starter uh, not retracting issue, but I think uh, what it was doing before the binding, the locking up of the engine uh, was the ring. So that is awesome, awesome news. Just gonna do this a few more times. Oh, that's nice. So anyway, let me show you what's going on with the starter. Okay, so I've installed all three shims and the starter is still not low enough. Now I used a little bit of anti-seize here on the flex plate. This was actually a very common repair procedure at Mercedes-Benz when I was a dealer tech there. Uh, this trans is literally leaking as we speak. <laughs> uh, but that would, on those cars, they would squeak because uh, this was all kind of dry. So anyway, uh, I put a little anti-seize to help this thing retract and it isn't really helping much. So right now it's out and I can't even push it uh, back with my screwdriver. I cannot get this thing to retract by itself. This is about as good as it gets. So I'm gonna do what a lot of you guys wanted me to do in the last video. I'm just gonna send it because I really wanna see if this thing will fire up uh, and run it all. So even if I'm risking damaging the starter, I'm going to do it, okay, for the sake of hearing this engine run. <laughs> and if we have to, we'll get a new starter uh, in the next episode and I'll figure out exactly how to shim this. So anyway, I'm gonna go put the plugs in, charge the battery back up a little bit, and we're firing her off. All right. Okay, that did not sound very good uh, towards the end there. The cranking sounded a little wonky, but I'm gonna get some uh, starting fluid or something inside of the carburetor to try and make this thing start a little bit easier. We'll try it again. Sounds really good, although I was starting to hear kind of a knock towards the end. I'm gonna go check on the starter, but it runs. <laughs> Guys, check this out. The starter gear has fully retracted, so maybe with the engine firing up, it kind of just rattled its way back. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm not super experienced with spacing out starters, so comment down below, guys. Uh, it's working right now. I'm just gonna kind of go with it, but uh, man, we have a really, really bad transmission leak. This is just from sitting for like five days, but anyway, uh, I'm going to just check the oil again. I, obviously, I filled it up with oil, uh, and I'm uh, we're gonna run it again. I don't even know what to say. Let's start it back up. I'll open uh, the garage door, though, because we are getting smoked out. <laughs>
There you have it. <laughs> the super weird Firebird is alive. She's alive and actually runs really, really good. I'm hearing a little bit of ticking, and this is uh, this seems to be disconnected. Probably the vacuum advance. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, look at that. Oh my gosh, the uh, distributor's like totally loose. All right, hang on, let me shut this off. Okay, so I noticed that the factory oil pressure gauge is reading zero, even when you rev it up, the needle doesn't move at all. Now, this is a 1985 Firebird. It very well could be the oil pressure sender unit. Uh, it could be the fact that the gauge is bad. Uh, who knows, but I don't wanna risk anything because so far we have gotten away with murder on this engine. Uh, I'm gonna hook up a manual oil pressure gauge in the next episode, verify that we have proper oil pressure. Uh, I gotta fix the transmission leaks. They're really, really bad. Uh, and then we have to figure out what is going on with this distributor as it just kind of moves around, it's hard to see right now, but the bolt in there uh, that has the little hold down, uh, it, it's stripped, so I can't even tighten it. So I'm gonna have to take that out. Uh, I'm gonna have to probably remove the distributor and tap that and whatnot and get that set. And then we're gonna get the timing light on this, set the timing perfectly. Um, but just the way it is, obviously I gotta put the belts back on. Uh, just the way it is though, it runs really, really nicely. So uh, yeah, guys. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. This is so cool that this car that had been sitting at a Copart auction lot just looking disgusting is now up and running and we got the hatch open. There's no metal shavings uh, in the oil. We got it to turn over by hand really nicely. Uh, so overall, this has just been a massive, massive success. Uh, so... The first one, it's actually the first thing I said in the last video, uh, seemed to be our problem. We shimmed the starter and although it wasn't working before, it is now, so comment down below um, what you think of that. And I'm gonna go dig up my old Chevy small block manual, figure out what the timing should be. Uh, I gotta read up on a few things, but we are gonna get to work and get this thing roadworthy and driving in the next episode. So let me tell you guys a little bit about this car's crazy history. Okay guys, a couple minutes of the history behind this car, everything that I've learned from the longtime previous owner and the builder of this car, and then I gotta take off for work. I'm gonna probably be late today. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I've messaged uh, with this guy named Rob, uh, and he is the one that built this car from 1991 to 94. So it took him three years to build this car. Uh, and he named it the Invader. So uh, Rob is a professional. He owns a co or he owned a company uh, called Louis Cell. I, I might be butchering that. Louis Cell Enterprises. So it's Rob Louis Cell. Uh, and he built Night Rider replicas. He's built about 20 complete Night Rider show quality replicas. All the fiberglass parts. So the whole dash, the crazy Night Rider dash, the exterior, everything he would do. Uh, now he said this car. Uh, the reason he built it, I straight up asked him like, why'd you build this car? He said he was obsessed with the Banshee concept. So in a reveal video, I mentioned to you guys that I thought this was loosely based off of, I think it was the 1988 Pontiac Banshee concept. It's a very futuristic looking car, crazy interior, crazy looking engine, and just very ahead of its time. And of course it never came out. So he was obsessed with that and he took a third gen back in 91. So this car was only like six years old at the time. Uh, and he spent three years building what you see behind me. Uh, so at the time he said he was working uh, a couple jobs basically. Uh, and he presented this car uh, to Tom Goad, special project manager at Pontiac. Sorry, I'm reading this off my phone. He showed him the car. Uh, he invited, uh, this Tom invited him and his family to visit the actual Banshee concept at Pontiac. Uh, VIP treatment, he says, uh, but nothing really ever came out of that. So uh, he said for Hollywood, he did provide the Knight Rider parts for the 2008 reboot, which I'm pretty sure is a Mustang actually. Uh, so they made parts basically for the Knight Rider reboot. Uh, and then, yeah, he's made uh, 20 kit replica cars, sold hundreds of parts all over the world uh, for people to build their own kit cars. Uh, and, uh, and then he retired a couple years ago and now he builds Model Ts uh, in his spare time. So uh, I got to speak to the guy that bought it from Rob. His name is Chris. He bought it in 1995, so right after it was built and he owned it until 2015. He did all the suspension work that I showed in the original video, uh, which is some really nice quality stuff. And then he put the Crate Jegs engine, uh, the mildly built transmission. It's a, a four speed 700 R4. Uh, so he said he put about $10,000 uh, into this car and he drove it. He enjoyed it and it did stay indoors in his barn, but he did use this car uh, quite a bit. He said he loved it. 
Uh, and I really hope one day to show him and Rob the car again. Rob is actually in Michigan about five hours uh, from me here in Chicago. So I don't know who owned it uh, for the last like five years. I guess I could start Googling his name. I found his insurance card, but either way, I'll let you guys know if I find anything uh, from the previous owner. But there is a lot of dirt and debris under the hood here that you can see little mouse droppings and stuff. I think it just kind of sat around uh, for many, many years. So uh, this was the Invader based off of the Banshee concept built by a guy who built professional kit replica cars uh, and had a little bit of a connection with Hollywood uh, for the reboot in 2008. So $1,100 for this car. I could not be happier. I'm so happy we got it running. We checked everything off the list. Uh, and this is turning out to be just a really cool project. My first car was a 1988 Trans Am GTA. So this is bringing back uh, a ton of memories just sitting in there and stuff like that. So anyway, uh, if you guys enjoyed this video, subscribe. If you're new to the channel, maybe you just started watching because of this car, consider subscribing. Uh, we're going to start making some more videos with this, getting it road worthy. I might even drive it to Michigan. Uh, I have an LS1 Turbo Trans Am that I've built over the course of 16, 17 years, something like that. Uh, so anyway, subscribe if you're new, share this video. Uh, most importantly, have an awesome day.